in the operating room. Looks like it might be a little choppy, so I apologize, but I really wanted to answer your questions about what happens with fibromyalgia when you go under anesthesia on a table like this. I had a patient recently with fibromyalgia who came into this operating room, or, or one just like this, and had a fascinating experience that was initially really scary for them, but they ended up waking up with much more calm and peace than you would have expected. Hey Alexis, Sophie and Heidi, good to see you all. Fibromyalgia is like turning on everything in your nervous system to super high volume. It's like literally going to this knob here and cranking up the volume all the way. And that's what all of the pain inputs do to your body. Everything that you, your sensory inputs will take in gets amplified, whether you're hearing it, seeing it, feeling it, etc. This patient came in and they had their emotions also volume amped up. Uh, it was a woman in their 20s and they actually started crying as soon as they put their head down on this comfy rest here. Not because it was uncomfortable, but just because that emotional volume was brought up from the different people talking in the operating room, from the anticipation of the pain of what's going to happen with the anesthesia. Now, in these certain circumstances, as you know, you can't just slam in the white medication. You can't just put the mask on them. You can't just connect them to a ventilator like what you see here. You can't just put the problem away. You need to address it. You need to speak with them. You need to, if need be, pause the surgery before you give them the first bit of relaxing medication. Because you can't just go to sleep with the volume amped up all the way, because if your sensory gain is increased that high, you're going to wake up potentially with more pain, with more side effects after anesthesia, with a greater chance of complications. So I had to pause, I had to wipe the tears, had to remind them that they are the most important person in the whole world for the next two hours of their surgery in this operating room. That is how we should go to sleep for anesthesia. And as much as possible, even in emergency trauma situations. Hey Alexis, I'm sorry about the lag there. It's the best we can do today, but I appreciate <laughs> your feedback there. Now, what happens under anesthesia is also not typical for patients with fibromyalgia because their central nervous system is also amped up. When they get the anesthesia, some of them have reactions as if they had POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Their heart rate can go up, their blood pressure can go all over the place. And this is also indicative of one of fibromyalgia's also effects in the bodies. One of fibromyalgia's, sorry, other effects on the bodies, autonomic instability, which is why we see overlap, we suspect, between POTS and fibromyalgia. Diabetes and fibromyalgia, also these spikes in blood sugar, perhaps are also related to all sorts of fluctuations that are amplified in patients with fibromyalgia because their nervous system is amped up. This patient needed extra medications to help stabilize their blood pressure, their heart rate. The anesthesia went safely. They woke up comfortable, but with emotional distress. So as you know, the typical kicking, screaming, sometimes cussing, but this individual rather remarkably snapped out of it very quickly. And I was really happy to see that instead of it being a 10 minute or 15 minute or one hour, or in some cases days, if not a week after surgery, within minutes, they were back with it. I was very impressed that this individual was within a couple of minutes back with back on earth after wherever the anesthesia had taken her and most importantly was not in pain was not was not uh, 
reading these comments here and I can't help but laugh as they're coming in. Like Steph says, central sensitization syndrome with CRPS, they didn't wake up with that central sensitization, but they woke up with greater calm than how they fell asleep. That is the power of top-down processing over fibromyalgia. We're going to talk about that. But this case is not unique. It happens every week with me in patients who go under anesthesia with fibromyalgia. The emotions, the central sensitization, the wacky body response to anesthesia, and sometimes waking up with that sense of peace and trust and love, etc. So, um, and I just can't stop laughing at the comments here. Um, Ozzy Celeste says that uh, he or she has fibromyalgia. I'm sorry that you're struggling with that. I hope that you learned something new today about this condition that we don't know very much about. It affects 2% of the population in North America. It's more common in women than in men. And there's tremendous association with diabetes. Trish, thank you, by the way. I appreciate that. And Jessica, I'm doing very well. Thank you. Di uh, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's. There is also a tremendous, like we said, central sensitization where the volume is brought up. So auditory stimuli, pressure, we call it pressure allodynia. You put pressure on parts of the body that aren't subject to tissue damage. And there it can be a dramatic pain response. Sarah V, what I'm describing is some of the differences between fibromyalgia and chronic pain. The pressure allodynia, the auditory sensitivity. Now remember, sensitivity is not the same as fragility. Being sensitive is not bad. Uh, a fi fibro and childhood trauma, yes, there is a link. There's also that link with chronic pain, so that doesn't make them different. But like I'm saying, the, um, the difference with the pressure allodynia, you don't need to have the tissue damage for that pressure to induce intense pain. Chronic pain does not always have the central nervous system wound up, the brain and spinal cord wound up. And unlike pain after surgery ordinarily, where you have tissue damage, you have a knife that has cut tissue, bleeding, uh, inflammatory response, etc., fibromyalgia may not have that same response. In fact, it's often absent. Uh, sensitivity and fragility, though, I just need to make one distinction here because many patients take it as an insult when I say they are sensitive and they can get triggered and we have a whole, you know, showdown here in the operating room from something that's not insulting at all. Sensitivity versus fragility. Please remember this. I, I, sensitivity is nothing more than being attuned to your body or to your environment or both. You can pick up on small changes in your body and in the environment as opposed to somebody who's aloof, who might not be sensitive to those changes, how others feel, how they themselves feel. <laughs> And thank you, Alexis, for that. And we are going to talk about your topic about colored uh, patients in the emergency room and how they may or may not be treated differently. I appreciate that. Thank you. About fragility and, and sensitization, uh, sensitivity, two different things, because the fragility indicates an individual who does not have the resilience or grit to withstand the insult or the trauma. Very different than being sensitive, where it doesn't mean you're weak, it just means that you were attuned to your environment or to yourself. And I hope that you appreciate that being sensitive is never a bad thing if you are resilient enough to control your response to the insult, i.e. the difference between being triggered and being accepting and facing it and not being manipulated by that triggering force. And by the way, everyone in these kind comments, I appreciate it so much. Lori, uh, Alexis, as always. Uh, <laughs> Trey. Ambulance outside, not sure if you heard that. So we need to then talk about um, when you're under anesthesia, we need to do certain things to help minimize your response to the surgical trauma that might cause worsening symptoms of fibromyalgia. 
that first starts with prevention. As you know, an ounce of prevention is a pound of treatment. So when we can get the right nutrition in, remember there's a connection between leaky gut syndrome, perhaps celiac, and fibromyalgia. So many patients come to me with either B vitamin deficiencies, protein deficiencies, or amino acid deficiencies, other vitamins, nutrients, etc. So we need to get your body replete with nutrients. It's often in the form of B12 being deficient, sometimes magnesium. We don't want to add insult to the injury of surgery. So this is where your nutrition is important. If you're taking gabapentin or pregabalin to reduce the amplitude of nerve transmission, we want those to be on board. I encourage most patients to continue those medications. If they're on amitriptyline or duloxetine to also turn down the volume on nerve transmission, we like to encourage those to be continued. You always have to speak with your doctors about what medications continue or discontinue. And uh, before I talk about actually being under anesthesia, I just want to do a small little um, shameless plug. If you appreciate me coming in here even after a long day in the operating room to share some of the secrets about your body and more importantly, the knowledge that can help empower you to advocate for yourself, please share what you learn with others, your loved ones, your friends, so that they can also be empowered to advocate for themselves in our broken healthcare system. And if you wouldn't mind hitting that like button uh, to support me doing this for you more often, I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, subscribing. As you know, I don't like to do any ad placements. I believe that this knowledge for you is where you're going to get the greatest potential uh, health benefits for yourself. The greatest gains come from knowledge and you being empowered. So when you're under anesthesia, let's get to that. We said that the volume is up, so we want to prevent further insults to your nervous system, epidurals, nerve blocks. We want to give you the right amount of opioids, lidocaine. These are ways that we can help minimize your sensory system from being overloaded because it's so sensitive, not in an insulting way, but realistically, your body is more sensitive to pressure, to pain, etc. And by the way, you're so welcome for uh, MW. Celiac, this is just the reality. There's overlaps and we need to acknowledge that when you have celiac or even non-gluten sensitivity, or sorry, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, you might be nutritionally deficient and that will make your surgical outcome potentially worse. Eleanor, good to see you. So I like melatonin as well around surgery because there are sleep disturbances that surgery causes, partly from the propofol, from the gases. You know, all of these gases are known REM sleep disruptors. The laughing gas, sevoflurane, desflurane, these can all cause REM sleep disruption, disrupt your sleep after your surgery, and we know that sleep is probably going to be helpful for your recovery. So we need to optimize your sleep. We know that in fibromyalgia there are changes in what we call the alpha spindles in your non-REM sleep. We know that anesthesia and surgery can further disrupt sleep. Therefore, we need to do everything we can to optimize your sleep. Melatonin is a good one. Nabilone, which is a synthetic cannabinoid, has also been shown to be beneficial for improving sleep. I don't like to necessarily start prescribing Nabilone if melatonin can fix it, if the right mindset can fix it. Something else, and this is actually the most important, well, this is perhaps the most important thing. Just like how we need to optimize our nutrition, our mindset has to be optimized. Fibromyalgia has impaired top-down analgesia, what we call impaired descending analgesia. What is descending analgesia? Your brain, and this is very well accepted, it's not controversial, your brain has ways for numbing pain in your body. When, and surely it's Nabilone, N-A-B-I-L-O-N-E, a synthetic cannabinoid. Um, Karen Brown Barrios, it's the first time I'm uh, seeing you here. Thank you so much for that. Thanks. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Descending analgesia rec uh, 
is your body's innate pain relieving property. So when there are soldiers in the battlefield to have these catastrophic injuries, how many of them feel the pain but are not paralyzed or crippled by it? They aren't in a state of psychological shock, even if they are in psychogenic, uh, uh, physiologic shock. And we know there are endocannabinoids, endorphins. These are molecules that the body creates that mimic opioids and mimic cannabinoids, like weed, that's correct, like fentanyl, etc., like morphine. And this is modulated by your brain telling the rest of your body to bring the volume down on pain perception. So instead of the volume up, which is where so many patients with fibromyalgia live, they are bringing the volume down. Your brain, the top of your body is controlling inputs through your spinal cord from, the, your, from your fingers, your arms, your legs, your belly, wherever. This is impaired in fibromyalgia. How do we help restore top-down or descending analgesia from the brain through the brain stem down to the spinal cord, descending in large part with our mind-body practice before surgery, can, uh, optimizing our mental health, whether it be depression or anxiety, PTSD, all of which are comorbid with fibromyalgia, adverse childhood experiences, etc. These all contribute to impaired descending analgesia. I will do the nerve block. I will give you the opioids. I will give you any anesthesia you want to block the acute pain from surgery, meaning the pain that happens in the moment. But if your sensitization is still through the roof, the second those medications wear off, your body will amplify everything right away. And we can't stay on those all the time. We need to find the balance of top-down analgesia with our anesthesia, with you trusting your surgeons, your anesthesiologist, your nurses, the hospital. You need to be comfortable and you need to also believe in yourself, have your purpose fulfilled before you ever walk into the operating room. Carmel and Divine, thank you so much. Or Devine, thank you for that, that super thanks. I appreciate it. There is so much more to fibromyalgia. We're just uh, scratching the surface about the practical considerations when you are having surgery that your anesthesiologist needs to keep in mind so that we don't worsen your body or your brain or your mind or your heart or your spirit, spirit whichever resonates with you. We don't want to fix the physical body and break the mind. That doesn't do any good. That doesn't help my patients when are com who are coming to me trying to heal. We want to help fix your body and heal your mind, your soul, your spirit, your heart, your brain, wherever you feel that you need your purpose fulfilled. And this is not woo-woo, because you come in the operating room with me one day, you will appreciate that all this woo-woo stuff that people throw out there is very real. When I have to look a patient in the eye and I have to see the pain that they're feeling, the worry, the anticipation, the anxiety, the complications in recovery, that is as real as anything, as anything else, as real as bleeding out on the table here. It's as real as breaking a bone. Uh, thank you, Shirley, for that. I, I appreciate that super thanks as well. Uh, so this was one of the questions you wanted me to answer on a live. So please feel free to ask again. And the next question is going to be about the next live we're going to talk about. Colored patients and how they're treated in the emergency settings. So uh, I hope that you know I'm here to answer your questions. You help supporting me by hitting the like button. And most importantly, empowering yourself to advocate for your health is the best that I can ask of any of you. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Heidi and Linda, Alexis, uh, Jessica. Let's answer two questions before I step out for the day. Maureen, thank you for that super thanks. Uh, like I said, let's do two questions. I know there's so many more, but I would like to uh, at least get a couple in here. Jess says colored is probably not the word I want to use. 
And I'm using the word that was posed in the question to me. It is not meant to be offensive to anyone. It is not meant to be triggering. It is meant to acknowledge the question that was asked of me. And I want to make the best effort to respectfully and with full dignity appreciate the, in the next video, the unfair or the inequitable care that certain populations receive. It's a reality of life. And if we don't acknowledge it, we as providers cannot begin to solve the problem. So please don't take the word choice that I use in concordance with what the person asked me as anything that would be offensive. I ask that of you. Thank you. And does fibromyalgia affect the heart? Sweet and salty? Yes. Anything that affects your central nervous system affects your heart. Your thoughts affect your central nervous system. Anesthesia affects your central nervous system. Surgery, pain, emotional pain as much as physical pain. You being triggered by somebody. Like that comment to me just now could have triggered me. And if you've seen me connect myself to the life support monitors, you've seen me induce panic attack like symptoms in my own body. Does that affect the heart? Can it hurt the heart? Over time, it absolutely can, which is why there was such a strong, if not unfortunate, relationship between depression, chronic pain, and cardiovascular disease. Absolutely. Um, I am Devil Woman says, I suffer from chronic pain, lower back from a car accident, and arthritis. Doctors keep telling me the pain is all in my head. This is a whole other video about where pain is in your body. Pain is in our head. Doesn't mean that it's not real, but pain cannot be experienced without you having a brain. Unfortunately, that does lead itself to gaslighting and to sometimes normalizing our, our experiences. But the truth is that we do need a brain to experience pain and we have incredible control to modulate pain perception between medications, emotional and psychological support from the outside world, and our mind-body health. None of it works in a silo. It has to all work together. Um, and Alexis, I agree with your wording. I did not perceive any issue at all there. Um, oh, Jessica, thank you for this. I didn't even see that. Thank you so much as well for that. Thank you. Um, Alchemy by Angela says that they have fibromyalgia, not fun. That's why we're raising awareness of it. Uh, last question. Um, uh, oh, Linda. Linda, thank you for that. I didn't even see that um, question there. Thank you. What if used everything naturally and nothing works and I have to take clonopin? You ask such a powerful question, Linda. Um, and we're going to end with this because... There is a time and a place for natural modalities. And they are life-saving when used safely over time because they don't have side effects typically. Or if they do, they're typically much less. In most, not all cases. However, we live in a world where we would not be alive if not for certain advances in medical technology, chemotherapy, surviving complications, from infectious disease. Think HIV neuropathy. How about surviving traumas? So your body has survived. You didn't bleed out after the car accident, but now you're left with perhaps phys physical and emotional pain and trauma from that accident. That is no longer a natural state of existence where one could have survived in an age before modern medicine. Therefore, is it unreasonable to expect modern medications to be helpful in these modern ways of living? Because like I said, you wouldn't have been alive if it wasn't for the surgery that fixed your body but may have left you with scars, physically and emotionally. That perhaps the safe and gentle natural products would not, would, cannot adequately treat and we know that undertreated pain and undertreated depression and undertreated PTSD affects your physical body in ways that we can see here in the operating room. 
That's why I never want any patients to feel inadequate if natural ways of healing don't work initially. But oftentimes with medications, and you know that I have a ketamine infusion clinic where I help patients reach a point with mindfully delivered ketamine to be able to let natural therapies and modalities fix or begin to heal themselves. It's not about all or nothing. We live in a world where we don't need to compromise. Thankfully, we're blessed to have access to modern medicine and natural techniques. And with the right knowledge, you can discover the right mix and balance for your body. It's not one size fits all. It never is. It's always about personalizing to who you are as an individual. Uh, Eleanor, good to see you. Uh, remember that you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. And if uh, <laughs> I would greatly appreciate it if you support this work by sharing this message with others. And if you could hit the like button. And I look forward to seeing you next time. We're going to talk about Alexis's question. Magic, thank you for that. Super thanks as well. So much appreciated. Um, and thank you all for your questions there. We will answer more of them in the next live. Until next time.